Mary Smitherman Cook passed away on Wednesday up in Minnesota. Uh, she Good morning. I was excited on Friday. I, we went to eat at uh, Hoy Fountain and got to see Twyla there. So it's good to see her back in church this morning with us. Are there other announcements in the bulletin that are not in the bulletin that need to be made aware of? Uh, <clears throat> Ken and I lost a sister-in-law this week. Uh, Mary Smitherman Cook passed away on Wednesday up in Minnesota. Uh, she had 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 family here years ago. Uh, services for Mary will be uh, a burial at 2.30 this afternoon in New Providence and a, a visitation at 3 o'clock in Union at the community church, and then uh, memorial service at four o'clock. That's this afternoon today. Okay. Here, here one. Okay. I'll come down here. I want to bring you greetings from Mark Manier. Mark is journeying across Iowa, trying to average about 30 miles a day. He's walking and raising money for the Des Moines Area Pastoral Counseling Center. And uh, thanks for your support, either through prayer or donations, just everything. He's really feeling encouraged throughout this process. Uh, maybe pray for today. It looks like a fairly good line of showers heading east. And uh, pray that that has all dissipated by Tuesday, because Tuesday I'm going to join him from about Tama to Marshalltown. So uh, we're looking forward to that time of uh, walking and uh, think about just how we can help others. And this is one way Mark felt like he could raise some money to help those that can't pay for the services down there at the Des Moines Pastoral Counseling Center. So keep encouraging, keep praying, look at his blog, and you can go to Des Moines area Pastoral Counseling Center, and then you can find a place to follow the blog. I just want to say that I'm trying, I'm going to start gathering people for a, a project on May 7th. It's a Saturday. It's going to be yard work and possibly helping clean out a house, clean up. Don't know all the details, but if you want to uh, take an opportunity to serve, May 7th. Keep that free. I'll tell you more later. And I just want to remind you all of the chicken and noodle dinner that's next Sunday right after church. It's a fundraiser for the Friends Theological College in Kenya, their solar energy project, and I hope you all come. And Connie's cooking the chicken and noodles, so they're bound to be good. Our mission offering for next Sunday is for Kayla Hatch, and we've had lots of news about her lately that she will be getting married in October, and um, hopefully that the Maternity Center in Sierra Leone will be um, financially self-sufficient, um, but we still want to um, praise the Lord for everything that he has done there at the Maternity Center. Um, the water tank and the plumbing is done. The beds are made. Um, the waiting gazebo where the people will wait for um, to see the nurses um, has been built and painted, and the generator is bought, and the electricity is functioning. So there's been a lot accomplished there um, in the final stages. Um, and they're waiting for their government license, so they will soon be open. And she is now training about five nurses, and she will pick three of those nurses um, to help run the maternity center. So our offering next Sunday will be for Kayla.
Brooks Nelson, Dan and Diane did get there yesterday morning. We just praise God that he's living and healing. Let's, let's uh, pray for Brooks, Brooks right now, just for a minute here. Lord, just uh, lift, up, lift, up, lift up Brooks and his family and um, just thankful that, that, uh, that he's okay, that he's alive and um, doing well. And uh, thank you for the doctors. Um, down down there in Costa Rica that um, uh, worked on him and, and those that uh, have helped him as he came back to the States. Um, continue to watch over him and protect him and, uh, and uh, keep healing his body. Amen. I'm going to let you know that the new books for the Women's Circle for USFW are arriving daily. The ones that I have so far are now on the checkout bookshelf, and we ask that you please sign them out so that if someone's waiting for one of them, they know who to speak to and say, would you get, save that for me next? <laughs> so there will be more, but there are about seven of them there today. Good morning. It is a blessing to uh, be looking down and hear all the babies here at the church. I uh, saw Chesney on the shoulder and the Kennys were back there. They had the biggest grins on their faces. <laughs> that's, that's just wonderful. Um, wanted to give you a reminder. Uh, we'll be doing Quaker Bakers on May 7th. Uh, so if you are good with baking or you're good with uh, visiting folks or delivering, that type of thing, please feel free to join us. We usually start at 10 o'clock in the fellowship hall. But again, if you'd like to do donations also, because you, you may not be able to attend, feel free to either see me, Julie, or Connie um, today. And if you have not been delivered to yet this year, and I know this is going to Feel like you're going out of your way uh, let us know that also so that we can make certain that we stop by to see you on this trip okay um, men father's day is coming up and i'm letting you know ahead of time june 19th we'll be doing our second annual bow tie competition so this should give you plenty of time to find your best looking bow tie or you know your ugly bow tie that you've gotten for Father's Day. I don't know. But we'll be doing that second competition June 19th, so be prepared. You said this is the second annual? Yeah. I must have missed it last year. <laughs> and I don't have a bow tie, so I better get on that. I don't think I've ever worn a bow tie. <laughs> oh, it really is a bow tie. <laughs> this one would win? Yeah, okay. All right. I don't, I don't think everyone can take me seriously while I, while I read the scripture here. Let's read this morning from Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded, and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He, he gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds. 
kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for his people a horn. Let the praise of all his saints of Israel, the people close to his heart, praise the Lord. Amen. Let's uh, bow this morning in prayer as the ushers uh, come forward and take our offering. Lord, let us praise you. Let all the earth praise you. We're so grateful um, today and just ask that uh, you would use these gifts that we gladly give back um, to do your work. Help others and touch others. Amen. rise up together and sing our response glory be to the father hymn 812 or you can read along with the lyrics sing with the lyrics on the screen glory be to the father to songs 8, 9, and 10. And Kevin, did we do the arrow or do all the verses? All the verses. Okay, Jenny? Come thou almighty King Help us thy name to sing us to praise, Father all glorious, for all victorious, come and reign over us, ancient of days. Come thou incarnate word, gird on thy mighty 
mighty sword, our prayer attend. Come and thy people bless, and give thy word success. Spirit of holiness, on us descend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness bear. In this glad hour, thou who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and ne'er from us depart, Spirit of power. To thee, great one in three, eternal praises be, hence evermore thy sovereign majesty may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. And I'd like for, is Kendrick here? Would Kendrick come up here please? Assisted by his grandmother. How you guys doing this morning? How's Grace today? You doing okay? Uh-huh. Good. Give me five, sister. All right. Elizabeth, how are you, honey? Jordy? Katie? And you know what? Look, look at Kendrick. Look how handsome he is today. He has what? He has a bow tie on, doesn't he? And you know what? I got to thinking about Kendrick and his bow tie. And you know, and you know what? We're told to put on Christ, to be like Jesus. You know something about Kendrick? First of all, he's handsome. Okay. He's fun. He's kind. At least most of the time. Well, hi there. How are you doing? What is your name? Kaylee? Well, welcome. Oh, Kindley. Oh, McKinley. I'm sorry. I'm going to get it right on the third time. McKinley. Well, you know, Kendrick's attractive, isn't he? Good looking boy. All right. You know something about Jesus? That Jesus is attractive. His love and his mercy, him going to the cross for us, him dying for us, is attractive. And we want to become like Jesus, don't we? Isn't that our goal as Christians, is to become more like Jesus? To be like Him? Well, the reason I got the bow tie is, if I put this bow tie on, like Chip had it on earlier, I'm a little more like Kendrick. Kendrick, look here. I've got a bow tie too, brother. Yeah. And so when, if we love Jesus, we want, we want to dress like Him, we want to look like Him, we want to act like Jesus. You don't want to? Oh, okay. That's all right. Well, because maybe Jesus doesn't wear skirts. Maybe that's the deal. All right. All right. That's okay. But we want to become like the person that we look most up to. And for me, that's Christ. That's Jesus. No one else has died for me. No one else has sacrificed himself for me. But Jesus did. So I want to become more like him, just like I want to become more like Kendrick. So when we think about Jesus and our journey as Christians, as people who believe in Jesus, we want to remember that to be like him means that we have the same kinds of attitudes in Jesus, in us. Can we name some of the attitudes that are in the heart of Jesus? Some of the things that Jesus believes and acts out of? Caden? Your heart, you, and what, what, are you, what are some of the things you think live in the heart of Jesus? He went to the cross to what? For our sins. To for sacrifice. So if we have a sacrificial heart like Jesus, we're becoming more like him. Jordy, can you think of something about Jesus that's attractive, that makes you want to follow him in his heart? That's right. It's love. Elizabeth? Is love. 
His sacrifice, His love. What else about Jesus' heart? When, we think of, when you think about Jesus, what do you think about His person, His heart, His attitudes? Mm-hmm. Ah, He loves us, He died for us, and He takes care of us. And that's the kind of person I want to be. Don't you want to be like Him? Don't you, Jordy? Yeah. Grace, how about you? You want to be like Jesus? Yeah, I thought you did. All right. So when we go to Sunday school and we learn about God and we learn about Jesus, when we listen to our parents, when we watch people who are compassionate, who do justice, who love people and help people, we're becoming like Jesus. I put on the bow tie to look like Kendrick, but those are the things we put on inside of our hearts. Being kind, being compassionate, sharing our toys, taking care of big brother, or excuse me, little sisters or, or little brother, helping mom and dad out, helping grandma and grandpa out, helping the children at school, being friends to people who don't have friends. That's being like Jesus. Just as I put the tie on to look like Kendrick, when you do those kinds of things, you're putting on your clothes to look like Jesus, to be like him. Okay? Does that make sense to you, Katie? Our hearts, Jesus' heart, our heart. Same things inside of us. Moves us to being more like Christ. McKinley, you doing okay, honey? Okay, good. Well, who can we pray for today? We're going to pray for Brooks. Brooks was in a bad accident down in South America. We'll pray for Brooks. Who else can we pray for today? Grace? Your mom, okay. And your dad. Okay. okay, we'll pray for your family. Jordy, anybody you want to pray for? And your papa? Okay. Your sister, Harper. Joshua. Well, Twyla's home. That's a good question. Twyla got home last Monday and she was sitting out here on her deck. Okay, so she's feeling better. Good question, Kate. Anybody else you need to pray for? All right. Let's take hands together. Take my hand, can we? Gracious Jesus, thank you for Caden. And thank you for Caden since the part that was asking about Francis and Twyla. And Lord, we ask you to continue to bless Twyla. And thank you that she's home and Francis isn't in that house all by himself now. And Lord, bless Grace's parents and her grandparents that she loves and they love her. And Lord, we ask you to bless Harper. And Lord, grace Joshua. We're glad he's feeling better and doing better. And Lord, thank you for McKinley being here today. And watch over her. And Lord, thank you for Kendrick. What a gift. We ask you to bless all of our children. And also bless us as your children, as your children, Lord God. And help us to have the same heart that was in Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Oh, and Lord, we ask you to watch over Brooks who's recovering from a bad accident. Help him to heal up in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Ladies, if you'd like to get some old candy. <laughs> Last week, uh, Elizabeth ate her Tootsie Roll and a tooth fell out, so she told me I need to get better and fresher candy. <laughs> Kaden, would you like to get a piece of candy, brother? Thank you. How are you doing, Al? Al, help me up, would you? <laughs>Scripture this morning <clears throat> comes from Revelation 21, 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, 
for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. The word rapture comes from an old French word which means carried away. I want you to hold that kind of in your mind. Carried away. There are a host of reasons I've heard from people why they don't attend church. If I would darken the doors of the church, the roof would cave in. Or I'm not good enough to go to church. Ding, 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 ding. You're exactly right. You're not, and neither am I, and that's why we go. Because we're not good enough. Here's another one. The church is full of hypocrites. Yep, you're right again. But the only difference between you and I is, I know I'm a hypocrite and want to get better and get healed, so I'm less of a hypocrite, and you don't have the intellectual honesty to admit that you're a hypocrite. Another excuse is, church is just too real. Our gatherings in worship and Christian fellowship better be about what is real and truthful about us and God, or it's just a game. Yeah, church is where the masks come off so Christ can drain the toxicity out of our spirits and we become regenerated so we can become more like Christ, shaped into that image of Him which is perfect. Now the opposite excuse is also prevalent. Many people, especially millennials, don't attend church because they don't believe it's real enough. Many feel like church is too otherworldly or disconnected from the ins and outs of their lives. They get the sense that all that churches care about is, in the words of Toby Mac, punching a ticket to ride to the other side. That getting people saved so they can get to heaven is the extent of the church's thinking. It's, it's kind of typified by the preacher who goes into a bar and, and says, anybody who wants to go to heaven, stand up. Everybody stood up except for a drunk in the corner and the preacher says, my son, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? The drunk says, when I die, sure, I thought you were taking a load up now. As I mentioned earlier, there's plenty of excuses for not gathering to worship the living God, that it's just too real. And I wonder if that is how people describe our church, that it's it's just too real, too honest. And here in this great vision that the Spirit of Jesus gives to the angel and the angel gives to John is this vision of a new heaven and a new earth coming down out of heaven from God. And this text is really interesting because the Greek word is kainos for new. It's not neos for like a new car, a new lawnmower, a new stove. It's kainos. It means that it's qualitatively different. And in Greek, It doesn't read a new heaven and a new earth. It says heaven new, earth new. Heaven qualitatively different, earth qualitatively different. And this is the vision coming down out of heaven, this new Jerusalem on this new earth and this new heaven. And we're told that there's no longer any sea. And this is very important to understand the metaphor and the symbolism of sea. Sea was in the Old and also in the New Testament a symbol of chaos and destruction and death. 
And where the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem occur, there is no longer any chaos and destruction and death. Only life from God. And the sea is no more. So our greatest fears, our sorrows, our mourning is taken away from us. And everything that causes those things is eradicated because we are in the presence of God who wipes away every tear. The sea in Revelation goes on because in the throne room of Roman, Revelation 4 and 5, the sea is like glass. God has tamed the sea. It is no longer chaotic and full of death and destruction. When the seventh seal is opened in chapter 8, John writes in vivid imagery that the sea is the place of chaos. A third of the sea becomes blood. A third of the animals died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. And in chapter 10, the mighty angel stands with one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. And the dragon at the end of chapter 12 is standing on the seashore summoning the first beast in chapter 13 who comes up from out of the sea symbolizing the Roman Empire. And while there will be a beast from the earth as well, the sea is always associated with chaos and death. And this Sunday's passage describes the sea no longer existent. Indicating that the new heaven and the new earth are united once and for all. With the new Jerusalem, the city of God, descending upon the earth. And death and chaos will be no more. Wow. And we see the throne. It's interesting that in John chapter 4, a voice comes from the throne. And friends, we have to realize, we have seen the picture of the heavenly realms in Revelation 4 and 5. What we're seeing in Revelation 21 and 22 is not heaven. It's heaven on earth. In chapter 4, a voice thunders from the throne. But here, the voice is intimate. It's speaking to people. Behold, in the NIV, there's a disservice to the Greek. The NIV says, I am making all things new. But in the Greek, it's, Behold, look, see what's happening. I am making all things qualitatively different and new. It's a beautiful passage. God has begun, is going to complete His process of restoring and bringing heaven and earth together, united forever in the person of Jesus. Death and chaos will be no more. And God is among us. This is the language of He will be Himself with His people. He will dwell among them. This is covenant language from the Old Testament. It's tabernacle language. The tent that moved with the people of God in the wilderness. And this is what John is understanding. That this God will dwell with us. He will dwell with us in our battles and dwell with us spiritually. God Himself will be with them. And the presence of God is victorious in the battle. And all the things that caused us to weep and mourn will be no more. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order has passed away. A new order has become. And so we see this new Jerusalem, this perfect cube coming down out of heaven from God, the holy city, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And one of the great themes in the book of Revelation is what city are you wanting to dwell in? In the book of Revelation, there are three cities. There is Babylon, the whore, which symbolizes Rome and the Roman Empire. She is described dressed in scarlet and purple. She's gaudy in her filth of her atrocities and her shamelessness is what clothes her. You can live in that city. You can live in the city of greed and consumption. 
of power, secular power, and ruling the world. You can, you can go ahead and eliminate species of animals. The, the Roman Empire eradicated over 200 species of animals because of their gladiatorial fights and the fights in the rings. You can oppress the cosmos and the earth. You can live in that city. Or you could live in Jerusalem where they crucified the Lord and where the two witnesses bear witness and are killed. There's no rapture in the book of Revelation. I'm sorry. People bear witness and their lives are accepted. They are ascended, ascended into the presence of God Himself. So you can live in Jerusalem a religiously oppressive, nationalistic, narrow-minded city. Or you can live in the new Jerusalem, the new city from God, that's beautifully dressed, adorned for her husband. And that's the choice we're given in the book of Revelation. The three cities that we can live in. And what's interesting is that contrary to the apocalyptic thinking, there is no rapture or future snatching up of Christians from the earth in the book of Revelation. Instead, it is God who is raptured. God comes down and takes up residence among us. Revelation is profoundly ecological in the sense of declaring that God's commitment is to the earth and it's the earth that is the center of God's salvific work. God is not going to destroy this earth. God's going to renew this earth. And we can either participate in that city and in God's way or we can choose to live in a different way. The tabernacle of God I shall dwell with them and they will be my people. The tabernacle represented the presence of God. The verse denotes intimate and close fellowship with God in a perfect and unbroken way, face to face with God and Christ. And what God did in the isolated event in Jesus Christ, He's going to do on a cosmic scale and according to the Greek, has already begun that. And John is shouting out that this same God is coming to live forever in our midst. John is saying He is coming to heal every disease and wipe every tear. And just as heaven and earth intersected in the holy city of Jerusalem where God met earth, now the new Jerusalem is completely joined together because it's in Jesus that heaven and earth meet and we can participate with Him. Paul says the same thing. In Ephesians 1.10, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. This beautiful city. And for the first time in Revelation, God says, Behold, I make things new. And isn't it interesting? If you go to the next slide, it is done. It is done. It means it is accomplished and is set in motion. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And here it's talked, it talks about God, and the next chapter talks about Jesus also as the Alpha and the Omega. To him who is thirsty will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. To him who is thirsty I will give drink without cost. And what text does that remind you of, my friends? It reminds us of Isaiah chapter 55. Come and buy and drink without cost. That God offers us grace to feed us and nourish us. It's without money. Even those who can't pay for it. And here is the beauty. This text is full of the grace and the beauty of God. He is making all things new. And while some interpret the revelation as this otherworldly escapist end time prediction, we see that this text, just how anemic that interpretation is, 
The revelation of John does not end in this catastrophic annihilation of the earth. Rather, it's about a God who is making all things qualitatively new. You and me, earth and heaven. We see this in the vision that it's just not about us being carried away from this earth. Rather, it's about God being carried away because of His great love for us and the whole earth and the cosmos. He is drawing close to the earth. The divine comes to set up shop, to pitch His tent, to tabernacle among us. The revelation of Jesus given to John isn't about the faithful avoiding difficulty or being raptured out of tribulation. It's about God's about God Himself being raptured into the heart of this earth. Now some of you are going to say, but what about 1 Peter, about how we're caught up, we're going to meet the Lord at the sound of the trumpet. We're going to go up and meet Him in the air. That's a beautiful, beautiful picture. But the picture is that of a Roman colony, the Roman citizens going out to meet the emperor. To usher him into the city. To usher him here where we dwell. It's beautiful. And those who enter the gates of the new Jerusalem, which are always open. The gates are always open. The old Jerusalem, the gates were shut due to enemies and fear and terror. But the new Jerusalem, the gates are always open. For people to go in and to go out. And there's no fear inside of this place. There's not even any sun or moon or other heavenly bodies to offer light. For the glory of God gives its light. And the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into the city of God. Earlier in the Revelation, the kings brought their splendor to Rome. But now it's to the city of God. And... No day will the gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. No fear. And whosoever may enter may have their thirst quenched by the river of the water of life. As we sit under the shade of the tree of life which heals the nation. And in the city of God, we'll find that God Himself is wiping away every tear. This is the new thing that God is doing. That God is always doing and that God will fulfill and accomplish. And it's real. In fact, it may be too real for some. Jesus, we ask your anointing to continue to be upon Fred. We ask you to bless him and Mid as they right now are in the valley of decisions. We're grateful, Lord, that there's really no right or wrong to this decision. But whatever decision Fred makes, help him to understand that it's the right decision and to lean into that and to move forward. Help him not put his hand to the plow and then turn around and look back. But to move ahead in confidence that in either way you're with him and that you love him. And Lord, we pray for strength and courage for both Fred and Mid. Hold them in the everlasting net of your love. We ask this in the fisherman's name and his name is Jesus.
Any other requests or thoughts before we launch out into the world and service? Let's take our song books, our hymn books, and turn to 384. And we'll sing the first verse of the Spirit song to each other and to God. Peace and grace of Jesus. Amen.